Okay, this is Dr. Mitchell again, and we're going to continue to talk about temperature regulation during exercise. And for this section, I want to talk a little bit about how we measure this, and then we'll get into some of uh, some key concepts in regards to core temperature and how the body itself, not just the mechanisms it uses, but physiologically, how do we know what temperatures are? How does the brain know? Um, when to begin sweating, when to begin, begin processes to control body temperature. So there are a lot of ways to measure temperature. My guess is the one that you're most familiar with is, well, taking your temperature, right? Using a thermometer, whether it is putting underneath your tongue. Uh, there are other ways to get that that's somewhat internal. Uh, and that's a common way to do that. Uh, now, during exercise and activities like that, that's a little hard to do. And truth is, those temp those um, those are ways, fairly inexpensive ways, though not always the most accurate way. Uh, another way we have is what is called thermography, or we probably know as thermal imaging. And so this is an example of a thermal image uh, from a thermal imaging camera. And what thermal cameras do is they are able to see an infrared spectrum of light that we cannot see by the visible eye. And this spectrum of light is proportional to heat produced by an object. And so here we have an image of an individual. And not surprisingly, uh, the skin, uh, those areas are lighter, more yellow temperatures, which are equivalent to higher temperatures. And where clothing is, the background, the hair, uh, obviously are cooler. And as we can see, those come up as more blues and purples, cooler temperatures. Uh, and that is one way, in fact, we use this in our lab as well, uh, to measure temperature. Now, the negative being is that these measure skin temperature. Uh, it's not necessarily core temperature. And they can be fooled by things, for example, like sweat. Uh, and there are other ways to um, alter some of these temperatures that make them a little not realistic. Plus, thermal imaging cameras are pretty expensive. Uh, they're a few thousand dollars at the very least. Uh, but it is a way to do that, though maybe not necessarily the most accurate way to measure core temperature. Uh, one that's used a lot in research, and this is going to seem a little extreme, are what are called swallowable thermal sensors. Uh, and they are literally what they sound like. You swallow them. And many of them run by Bluetooth. Uh, there's a few companies, Cortem, um, uh, IRR, which they basically sell these devices. Uh, you swallow them, uh, and then you have either an app or a device that continually monitors core temperature, obviously, until these, these pass. Now, the benefit being obvious, like you are really, really measuring core temperature, and it is incredibly accurate. Uh, now, you're probably wondering, safety-wise, these are considered quite safe. Um, but, you know, not necessarily the... the the, the way most people want to do this. They can be a little pricey. Uh, most of these companies sell these items at minimum 200 bucks a piece, often a bit more than that. Uh, so, but and definitely a way we could potentially measure core temperature. Uh, and these are important though, because we want a, a way we can measure temperature precisely. Right? Now, what's also key in understanding core temperature is how do we know to respond to core temperature. And internally, uh, the hypothalamus, which is part of the lower brain, it's also technically a gland, um, it plays a key role in maintaining normal core temperature. And hypothalamus via neurological input, via hormones, is able to keep core temperature within a pretty tight range. And it responds to changes in core temperature. It increases the core temperature, it increases sweat rate, um, it begins moving skin, uh, blood flow to the skin away from core areas. This is why often when we get warm, our skin turns red. Um, it's because we're attempting to move blood flow to outer surfaces to hopefully cool that down. Uh, blood flow is a, is a key way we can maintain body temperature. By the way, the reverse is the case in lower temperatures. We try to get blood flow more to the core. This is why often in cooler temperatures, our fingers, our nose, often appendages, toes, uh, get very cold because we're removing blood flow from those areas to keep the core warm. Uh, and so understanding hypothalamus is going to play a key role in this. 
uh, moving blood flow. It also receives uh, input from neurons, from, from various um, sensory receptors throughout the body to keep this in a fairly tight temperature. And to be honest, the hypothalamus does a pretty good job. Uh, we generally, unless it's extreme circumstances, are pretty good at keeping core temperature normal. Again, uh, ruling out extreme circumstances. Uh, obviously, um, if there are dysfunctions in hypothalamus or dysfunctions in receptors, this can affect sensing core temperature. Uh, there are disorders where that's the case. One actually is multiple sclerosis, uh, MS, uh, which is really um, a neurological issue, though one of the side effects is an impaired ability to maintain normal body temperature. Um, and if you're familiar with someone who has MS, uh, particularly in warmer temperatures, they, they'll definitely struggle and often having a cooling vest or something that assists in that process uh, because of impairment in some neurolo neurological aspects of maintaining body temperature. And so hypothalamus is going to play a key role here in understanding that uh, depending on what the, uh, you know, whether we're talking a heat load, increased heat, or in cooler environments, we're going to see this act to affect sweating. We're going to see this act to alter blood flow, to allow, uh, whether it's needing to get blood flow to the core to cool it down or blood to keep it warm or blood flow to the surface to cool it down. The hypothalamus is going to play a key role in instigating that. And so really the hypothalamus plays a key role here. And uh, the one time that many of us probably experience this in, in a not, not uh, so enjoyable way is when we experience fever. Uh, when we are sick, uh, sometimes if we have, um, uh, we're dealing with a virus or even severe injury, um, we can uh, see fever uh, as a result of that, where we're seeing an increased body temperature. Uh, now, we talked about a little bit in the immune system that fever is, a, is an immune response. It's a way to create an environment so that various uh, viruses, bacteria, what have you, um, will struggle to survive. And so hypothalamus plays a role in that. And when it comes to fever, hypothalamus, not surprisingly, is important. Uh, and as much as we may try to cool body temperature and that can be beneficial in allowing us to feel better, uh, hypothalamus does play a role here. And, and again, another reason why exercising when we're sick, not advisable, uh, because we are, we're, we're, we're making a an environment that's already difficult to exercise in, already a difficult to um, maintain uh, normal protein function, we're only making it harder when we exercise and increase body temperature even more. Uh, and so we want to grasp that. And, and the last thing I want to finish with, and we talked about this last uh, time when we talked about evaporation, you know, so much of what we're talking about here is heat and heat production and dealing with exercise in warm environments. But as we talked about evaporation, heat's not the only factor. And humidity, which is simply the percent of air that's saturated with water, is also a key element. And we talked about last video in regards to what that means, or, or, or creating an um, evaporation gradient to which evaporation can, can occur. And we have high humidities, 80-90%. There's less of a gradient, evaporation doesn't work well, and therefore we're not able to dissipate heat via evaporation very well. Well, practically we can measure this and we can measure humidity. That's fairly easy to do. And often when combining uh, humidity and ambient temperature, we come up with what's called a heat index. And you've probably heard of this term before. If you've ever looked at a weather app or something like that, it shares a heat index, which really is just a value to attempt to tell someone how, how warm it feels. And really what it is, it is an equation, and we won't go into the equation so much, of taking humidity into effect in regards to temperature. And so not surprisingly, when we are in warm environments, and we're going to say warm environments above 80 degrees, as humidity increases, this heat index increases quite a bit. And so yes, exercising in, let's say, 90 degrees in a desert where it's maybe 20% humidity, and 90 degrees in, say, Florida, where it could easily be 70% humidity, um, are not the same. 
the ability to evaporate uh, via sweat is greatly impaired in these human environments. So yeah, so yes, uh, the ability to exercise effectively will be far less in these warm and humid environments as opposed to just warm and dry environments. And so yeah, another one why, why Florida is not the easiest place to exercise, particularly with our humid conditions. Uh, but as we'll see in the next video, there are ways to acclimatize this. There are ways that we do develop to, though we cannot be, become excellent at this, we just don't, uh, we can slightly improve our response to these warm and humid conditions. And we'll take a look at those in the next video. Uh, see you in the next video.